I see the number has stabilized. So uh, uh, we're very happy uh, today to have uh, two uh, world-renowned scholars, uh, uh, Professor Zhu Guohe from uh, Chicago Booth and uh, Professor Jadal Stoss-Latin from uh, uh, the University of Minnesota. Uh, Professor uh, Zhu Guohe will present his uh, recent work, uh, what gets managed gets, uh, what gets measured gets managed. A very interesting case study, an important case study on uh, China's economic reforms uh, in uh, the state sector. And the discussant will be uh, Professor Chetos dos uh, who is a leading uh, macroeconomist and at the same time knows China very well. Uh, both of you, uh, each of you will have uh, 25 minutes. Uh, Zhubo, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thanks everyone for joining today for this uh, monthly event. Uh, uh, today, I'm, I'm, disc I'm uh, presenting a paper joined with uh, Liao Guanming and uh, Wang Baolian. This is the, on the SOU reform. All right. Uh, so let me just get to the question directly. So this, this uh, reform, that called it EVA reform, is on the core issue of cost capital and capital budgeting. So cost of capital and capital budgeting are the core of corporate finance. It's really about how do you allocate your capital into different, you know, different uh, firms. And even within the firm, what kind of project you take, what kind of project you don't take. In the sense that in the um, AUS and the well-established uh, market economy, that's just basically, it's very useful in conceptually. I think in the context of China, it's even more use, useful because we are thinking about the consequence of potentially non-market-based capital, cost of capital. Uh, this is the exact, you know, intrinsically linked to the uh, uh, very influential literature on this uh, capital allocation efficiency, Shiana Klino here. Um, and uh, what when you read the Shiana Klino, you will see that it's a very macroish in the sense that they treat the firm as an operating entity. They just say the firm is making decision and that there's a, they are facing a lot of distortions, etc. Obviously, it's a take as given. Uh, but uh, from my perspective, which is the more micro side of uh, these issues, is the managers who decide the investment. So as a result, that the you know the compensation scheme, or in the context of China, is the evaluation scheme become important. Now, then that immediately linked to another broader literature on the corporate finance side is on manager incentives and the firm behaviors. And uh, as a first uh, important uh, contribution of this paper to the literature is to provide a causal evidence on the impact of a managerial incentive on firm behavior. Okay, so the, almost 80% of the paper is on that part. Um, now, the, the, there's a 20, 20 to 25% of the paper is on ask, you know, getting some answer to the uh, even broader question, bigger question of this capital allocation deficiency. Uh, and uh, and this is the, our perspective is that, uh, you know, it's basically separation of ownership and control um, everywhere, even in United States, China, it's the same thing. The question that uh, how, you know, is this China, can, can China fix it by the EVA reform? You will see that basically the SASAC imposed some cost of capital to different firms and hoping that uh, that can change, uh, improve the, improve the uh, allocation, allocation efficiency. So we have some preliminary results towards that direction. In the, in the sense that, uh, yes, uh, our, uh, uh, we did uh, our best uh, given what we have in thinking about uh, uh, the welfare implication, but do not have too much hope on that. It's just a much bigger question that we can answer. Okay, so uh, let me give you some institutional background. Is this good now? Good, okay. Uh, SASAC established in 2003, um, one of the important, important tasks that a SASAC has is to conduct the performance evaluation of SOE managers, okay? SASAC is uh, Guo Ziwei, okay? In case that uh, people do, do not know the correspondence between the English name and uh, what uh, is a Chinese name. It's a Guo Ziwei and uh, they were trying, to, uh, they were uh, de de uh, delegated by the state to uh, monitor and uh, uh, evaluate the SOEs. The SOE managers will be evaluated in many, many different dimensions, but on the performance side, performance side, EHG so-called, performance side, uh, there's an objective score and there are four performance measures. 
uh, Ao Yi used to be a very important part of the measure, our return on, on equity. Uh, so, so, so before was a, a 2000, 2003 to 2009, it's Ao Yi. The target of EVA reform starting from 2010 is basically replace Ao Yi by EVA. Ao Yi by EVA. So in 2010, the central SASAC replaced the OIE by EVA. EVA is called economic value added. And after that uh, proposal of the, uh, uh, of the EVA reform, most provincial SASACs followed and adopted the same or very similar policies, okay? The key of EVA, I will explain of how do you calculate this EVA, but, it, but it just highlighted that the, there's a cost of capital that the uh, Beijing basically fixes at the 5.5 percent. Okay. Now let me explain to you what what's the difference between the ROE and the and the EVA. Think about a best example is that suppose a company who raise the raise the capital from equity side, but uh, leave these cash, raise this capital as a cash on the on the on the on the uh, uh, firm. In this in the ROE sense, it's basically you know. There's a, you can treat it as no cost of having the money raised from the from the from the shareholders. Basically, there's no sense of a co like opportunity cost of capital. But EVA will say, look, look, you have to minus, you have to take off the opportunity cost of capital. Okay, whatever your equity is, whatever your whether you take it from debt. Okay. So as a result, the EVA is very similar to this idea of this uh, MPV, uh, but with some appropriate adjustment. So EVA will be the equals the net operating profit minus the just cost capital times cost of capital. On the net NOP, net operating pro profit or the just ca capital, nothing is strange. It's just a very simple, very, very routinely followed the, whatever the, the, the standard theory should, should imply. It's just that the cost of capital that's the most the most contentious and the most elusive concept that uh, you know, even in the United States here or Western you know, developed country, it's just uh, much harder to get. But, it, but in the sense that you know, we know what it is, just that much harder to measure. In the, in the China, probably that's even harder to get. And that's probably the reason why Beijing said that let's just use it as a very, you know, I don't know where they're coming from, 5.5 percent, and uh, and and it's it's uh, it's just a uh, um, one one size fits all uh, policy. And uh, what we do in, in the implementation of the policy, there are a bunch of other firms that they put a little bit of the twist. Uh, on make them a lower cost of capital. Maybe these 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 industries are a little bit more policy, you know, industrial or or, or political uh, um, motivated. That that's therefore that it's a more strategic sector. So they wanted to subsidize them. So have a little bit lower. Or some of them have a higher leverage. All the things that we you know we do not touch on them, but we we basically just excluded these firms from our exercise. Those samples are very, very small, and I will not come back to this end, uh, after this slide. So here's a, uh, another feature of the EVA uh, reform. It's a staggered adoptions. As, as I explained, it's the central, the Beijing central SASAC proposed that, and then those pro provincial SASAC followed, okay? Um, Obviously, you're going to worry that adoption may be endogenous. Uh, this is the part that we did, a, did, a, did a, the best work to, to really try to get the identification correct. So first of all, uh, I can assure you that there is no clear correlation between the timing of adoption and the local political economy or business cycle factors. So that's just on the, on the, on the, on the surface that that seems to be fine. But obviously you might, might worry those like unobserved parts. We have this uh, very nice uh, uh, institutional feature where we can include the province times year fixed effects. Uh, it's just basically exploiting the idea that there are potentially two, two firms operating in the same province, but uh, because of the, the, their, 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 their controlling Sussex, are different, therefore they adopt 
the EVA policy in a slightly different firms as a result that we can control the province year fixed effect. One example here would be the Yaxing coach. That's a bus manufacturer based in Jiangsu province, uh, but it is controlled by Shandong assessor. Those are very complicated histories that we are exploiting uh, these hit heterogeneity. Okay, so let me just give you one slide. Uh, uh, on the framework, and I believe that Cheto will discuss a lot of things of, 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 of this uh, uh, theoretical background. Uh, when we write down this, this uh, uh, theoretical framework, more or less is just to give a framework, framework, a very simple framework to, to think about the, the issues that we are getting. Um, so, so we strip away a lot of other things. So we have a production function FK, and the K gonna be financed by E and D. We have an EBIT, so it's standard a concave, a concave production function. We have this output wedge, tau y. The firm only gets one minus tau y times fk. This tau y could be firm specific. And the, the reason I introduced tau y here is not, be, not because we're trying to measure it later on. I'm trying to tell you that the, the key theoretical predictions were not depending on the specific tau y. Okay. So, Tau y includes the standard tax rates, pi equals 25%, but it could differ with other distortion like subsidies. Before EVA, the SOE is maximizing the following. After EVA, a, a, a SOE is maximizing the EVA, which is basically one minus tau y times F D plus E minus 5.5% uh, D plus E, right? So, uh, so this is the one minus, uh, one minus point two y 0.25 RD times D, that's basically the so-called tax shield that the, the, the debt is enjoying. Um, so our assumption is that debt is, um, is the margin to adjust. Uh, it's not, not necessarily a good assumption in the United States because that the stock market is, a, you know, the seasoned equity offering is very common. But in China, we show the data to show people that most of the time it's just the, the investment margin is through the debt, even for the listed companies, just because there's a lot of reg regulation on equity issuance. Okay, what's the empirical prediction? Before EVA, the first order condition for the firm will look like the following. One minus tau y times, times f prime equals 0.75 rd. So, then you will see that, okay, investment should be negatively related to RD before the adoption. After EVA, then you are supposed to be basically ignore your RD because, I, because the big government already told you what's the cost of capital, basically. And that this negative relationship, the above ne negative relationship sh uh, should weaken, basically. So as a result, and there's a critical value of 7.33% because that's basically, once I multiply by tau equals 25%, it's 7.33% converted to 5.5, okay. So therefore we run this diff and a diff uh, test. That's a standard diff, a diff. Key prediction gonna be the, first of all, that uh, beta one less, less than zero. So beta one less than zero basically says that before the EVA, um, Right. Before the EVA, when post to post is zero, that the beta one should be negatively related. And after the EVA, then beta three greater than zero, that just means that the negative relationship gets weakened. Okay. And then we add a lot of, uh, uh, as, as a promise, that these, these fixed effects. Another important prediction we will say is that the impact on ROE that our data allow us to measure is interesting in the sense that it's hurting ROE on both sides. Um, because that, you know, if in, in case that a firm has exactly the RD equals 7.33%, then what the, whatever they were maximizing is exactly what they were, uh, they're supposed to maximize it afterwards. So they should not change that much. But if you are away from that, then you're hurting. So as a result that we are testing it by creating these buckets of the previous like original uh, in interest rates. And as a result that the, the prediction will say that it should be basically hump shaped, okay? The prediction beta G should be hump shaped, the beta four should be the highest. All right, okay, data. I have two slides to talk about data. We have a standard SISMA database. 
we're focusing on the uh, listed firms. Um, the, uh, the sample period is 04 to 15. We focus on the listed company because in the end, we wanted to also think about the, me uh, the mechanism. The mechanism side, we have their compensation and, the, and the we have their turnover. That's why we, 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 we keep working on this system, uh, the, the, the listed companies. Um, the SOEs are defined as, uh, oh, from 04 to 015, uh, 04 is the first year that uh, the SASAC established. Uh, uh, and we stopped at 2015 because after 2016, the central SASAC changed its evaluation policy. Maybe because exactly we were you know, are going to show you that you know it's just the one size fits all. Um, okay, the uh, the SOEs are defined by ultimate control uh, of the SISMA. What, what our major work is to manually collect the identity of the controlling SASAC to try to figure out who is the controlling SASAC, and that's the major work that we do. Okay. This slide is a very important that I believe that Cheto might talk a little bit about it. I remember that I had a long discussion with uh, Michael on this as well. So first of all, it's about the measurement of interest rates. Uh, the measurement of interest rates that it's a very, very important topic for the accounting and the, and the corporate finance side because we always do this kind of thing. So, so uh, there's a long literature on how to account these things to the, to the best level that we can do. So we take the interest expenses that are reported by a listed company, then divide it by the average total interest bearing debts at all quarters. Uh, it's widely used. I don't need to explain more. Uh, there's a difference between interest bearing debts and the total debts. Um, and, uh, and, and the Cheto were asking us, what is this non-interest bearing? What do you think about it? My, my own perspective, it, this is not a, not a consensus is that, a, let's say accounts receivable, right? accounts payable, it's mostly it's a, a, it's a, uh, account, accounts payable, which is basically is kind of debt that are provided by your suppliers. But we typically think these are working capital. It's basically operation rather than the financing. Anyway, the last point that I want to emphasize is that it's just given the data limit, we do not have a loan level data. Uh, all this, these interest rates are average, not a marginal. That, that's the, you know, we cannot address that. The second point is that I have to tell you that the SASAC evaluation scheme is at the group level. Let me just making sure I have the right time. At the group level, uh, as a result that, uh, uh, um, that our sample is only listed SOEs. As a result that you might wonder that uh, are we have a distortion or not? Given that these listed companies are actually the better ones, okay? So, First of all, I want to, want to emphasize that the EVA metric is additive in the sense that once you fix the rates, that everything is basically the group level is add, adding up all the subsidiaries. So in that sense, if you're maximizing the sum, you should maximize each book. Okay, theoretically, that's fine. But we also collected some group level data with a similar, uh, I'm going to show you a similar results. Okay, summary statistics. So the interest rates that we got for the SOEs are 5.8%. 5, 5 that seems to be different from what Michael knows about it in the uh, the, 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 the I don't know the English name for that. Um, it, it, this is what we got. The correlation between interest rate and the leverage within the SOE sector, interestingly, is insignificant. It's only 3%. It's only 3%. That, when I first see it, I kind of feel that maybe there's some subsidy going on. And this is really the, the reason why the uh, SASAC would like to impose these cost cap. Improved code predictions. RD equals, if RD equals 5.5%, investment is not affected, ROE is not affected. If RD greater than 5.5, then investment should go up. Right, because after the EVA, basically the effective cost of capital go down. Then RD less than five point five, then you just do the opposite. Interestingly, RE should be the should be should be the same because it's just ma maximization. So these two things this is the, for our focus to show you as a in protocol result. Um, before I'm showing you the formal uh, uh, table, uh, just as a sense that I'm telling you that the, the uh, there's a, a you know you get a 
raw data feel that this is something going on. What I did here is basically I took these uh, treated sussexes and but stagger them as a time of a time of a, a, a policy adoption, and then sort these firms based on the one year before interest rate. One year before interest rate, I have a high group, which is the blue ones. They have a lower investment, which make makes sense. I also have a low invest uh, interest rate firms. They have a little bit higher capex, which also makes sense. And what's more important that before the adoption, it's kind of a flat, so it's kind of a parallel chain. And then after the EVA adoption, they, they converge, okay? So this is just a raw data, okay? Do not control anything. And I feel happy to see those things. Here's the table, then we, uh, we report everything here and here are a, a, a different columns, which is telling you a different level of the control. The control that I really, be very, very happy about is the last one. So firm fixed effect, uh, SASAC times year fixed effect, industry times year fixed effect, and the province times year fixed effect. That's that's the last column. And then we show it's 0.1 and okay. 0. Okay, so that's the baseline result. Um, uh, then in the baseline results, we basically put the post as, as a dummy in the sense that before, after. Right? So therefore, you're only picking up one number. The standard procedure in this literature will, will do this dynamic DID. Uh, and obviously, when you do dynamic DID, sometimes the figure becomes very ugly. That, that's what we see here. So, But anyway, that uh, I, I think that I would like to show you, basically, that what I would like to see is that uh, before the tre treatment, that's a minus one, there's no pre-trend, so that's basically kind of no, no pre-trend. Then afterwards, zero, after the shock, then you get a positive. The year one is somehow has, has a, uh, a insignificant result, but, uh, but at the zero, at the two, at the three, both, it's all positive. That's, that's exactly what we wanted to pick up. Uh, this is the, for the group level evidence. Uh, so for the group level, the, uh, the data we get is uh, from these uh, bond issuance. So in China, if you issuing bonds, that you, you have to disclose these uh, past, the, past the group level financial statement. Uh, Michael did some lot of work on that. Uh, and we just happens to see that. And then it's great that we can show you that it is a very much similar results. Okay. Placebo results, just showing you that if it's a, a non-SOE, then, then we do not see anything, okay. Uh, then uh, uh, this result is on this U-shape. So, so basically I already told you that what we're supposed to see and this is indeed what we get. Uh, okay. you, you have uh, three more minutes. Okay, good. Now the past one that uh, we, we also did the, for the economic mechanism, I this basically showing you that uh, 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 that uh, these, uh, uh, it's mainly through the CEO turnovers. And we calculate, we measure the CEO turnovers uh, as a demotions. Okay, so we, we, we did a lot of work to figure out uh, these, uh, you know, whether it's the demotion or, or promotion with turnover. And they're showing you that if the EVA, we, we can calculate EVA, right? Uh, showing you that before the adoption, EVA measure has no impact on turnover with the demotions, but after the adoption, that uh, the there's a, a positive, there's a negative loading on the turnover with demotions. Okay, compensation has a little bit of result, but a very very minimal. So that just is consistent with our thinking that this compensation probably is not the part to motivate these CEOs in China. Finally, finally, let me, you know, hopefully I will have another in total three minutes to explain this uh, allocative efficiency we, we are doing, okay? The, the welfare implication crucially depends on whether the true cost of capital are equal across firms or not. It's so very clear. If that indeed that uh, Beijing is like a god knows exactly what the cost of capital is, and it turns out that exactly every firm has equals to 5.5, then that, that, that's obviously the best policy. But of course it's not, right? We will organize our discussion with an underlying assumption, which is the firms within an industry has the same true cost of capital. 
And in here, we try our, the most final classification of industry. Total is about 150 industries that we ever get from the, from the SEC, uh, not the CS, CSRC. Okay, the industry within industry have the same true cost of is a shakily no assumption anyway. Okay, so we we basically show three things. First of all, EVA eliminates the so as a result that once you have these uh, these these the industry have the same cost of capital, then within the industry the cost of capital might have a lot of dispersion, but this dispersion is bad because they are supposed to be the same, but uh, you know given this given these distortions, it have, still have the dispersion. So we call those as a bad, bad dispersion. But across industries, they're supposed to have different cost of capital. Therefore, we call them a good dispersion. The idea is that the EVA policy is going to kill everything, kill everything. So while EVA eliminates the bad dispersion within industry, it kills the good as well. And I'm going to show you that indeed it kills good. Then the second is that we do a, a various decomposition. We ask the question that in the in the China data before the EVA policy, how much is a good dispersion? How much is a bad dispersion? And in that sense, that we are answering a little bit uh, of the question of this EVA policy towards the question of the, of, of the welfare. The third question is different. Um, the second bullet point within across is all in, within the SOE sector within the SOE sector. If you think about the overall, then you're gonna ask a question, how about a SOE versus a non-SOE? The, we did it, the last uh, test is just showing that after the EVA policy, there's a no, no effect at all that uh, the move, uh, of the moving capital from SOEs to non-SOEs. Okay, so I will show you these three. So first of all, this is basically showing that uh, across industries, initially, the, before the EVA policy, they have a dispersion, therefore their capacity is different. But after the EVA policy, they basically converged. So that in that sense, that will be, uh, the policy is a killing the good dispersion. This is a cost of capital decomposition is basically asking the question before the EVA policy, how much is a good dispersion? How much is a bad dispersion? So you can see here, total effect of the dispersion equals the within industry dispersion. Because we're assuming within industry, industry has the same cost of capital, therefore this, that dispersion is always bad. And then the second is kind of good dispersion, but killed by the EVA. And then here's a wedge between the policy rate and the, and the total. This captures the SOE versus non-SOE, basically. What I wanted to explain to you that interestingly, that whatever the way we measure these costs of capital, the paper explained to you, this is borrowed a lot from the corporate finance side, is that within industry dispersion, which is a bad dispersion, which the EVA is killing, is about twice of the cross industry dispersion. Okay, unfortunately, even with that, these two numbers, without a structural model, I cannot say that how do I convert these dispersions into a unified utils uh, or, or some TFP productivities. And I, so, so in that sense, I would say that indeed that EVA is helping in killing the bad dispersion, but also killing a, bond, a very significant part of, of the good dispersion. Finally, my, my last slides and uh, Okay, then I will conclude. Is that we also checked the MRPK and the EVA policy that Cheto might will say something about it. We try our best to, to measure the MRPK to bring figure closer to the to the original share and clean. Unfortunately, that uh, we follow you know Chen the Song paper, Michael's paper, we follow their procedure and we do not find anything. Uh, we think that it likely is because of it because of a measurement problem. All right, conclusion. Managerial incentives matters, obviously. It is a bit surprising that in the context of SOE reform, it actually matters in, because of people we think that it's, everything is, is a policy, is, is a political. And my last bullet point is really a little bit of my own thoughts is that a policy and intervention are always two sides of the same coin. A uh, greater reform effort, obviously you see that no hanging fruit anymore, everybody knew that. The, the preliminary evidence is basically suggesting that there's a substantial cost of a blunt, 
uh, plant a, a policy, but it's still waiting for the future research to really get the 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 the, the right answer. The how much is uh, how much is the bad? How much is uh, is is a good? I'm done here. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Zhubo. Uh, Chetel, please. Thanks for having me. Um, so, um, this paper uh, studies a particular form in China, where the, the management of, of state firms firms are evaluated using some formula by Sasek. They, they changed that formula uh, at some point with the concern being that, um, that um, it, perhaps, uh, perhaps some firms had um, uh, capital wages, who knows, they wanted to have, the, the thinking was, let's have a common standard and, and apply common cost of capital to all firms, five and a half percent. So the, the paper it does a very nice job actually uh, in, in exploiting causal evidence, exploiting that this reform was implemented over a long period of time, but not at the same time in every in every uh, um, province. So assuming that the timing of the reform is independent of performance of the firms, then you can use and you can interpret this as causal evidence. I'm going to discuss that a bit later. All right, let's make uh, two assumptions to get to get going. Number one. Let's assume that for these firms, these are state-owned firms in China, uh, debt is the only source of external finance. I believe that's a good assumption. Let's just swallow that. Second, uh, let's assume that firms can freely choose how much debt they want. I'm not so sure that that's a good assumption. But let's go with the assumption and return to it later. All right, so I'm going to present a, actually a simplified version of what, uh, what you uh, uh, just presented. Um, imagine, imagine um, so in, in this formula for, for evaluation of uh, managers by Sasek, there used to be the rate of return on equity used to be a big chunk of that. What is the rate of return on equity? Well, let's just think of, uh, it, it basically meant that the firms would maximize something like this. So this is, um, Imagine capital is the only input. So, and capital is debt plus equity. So F of D plus E, that's the total uh, uh, value added of the firm. And imagine, let's allow for um, firm specific output wedge. If you like, you can think of this just for now, let's just think of this as, as, a, as, an, implicit, um, as an implicit tax. If you want to think that that tax is the same for all, you can think of 25% of that. Good. So this is the after-tax um, uh, value added for the firm. Uh, and then the, we deduct the capital minus the, uh, minus the uh, return on, on the debt. Uh, and the, the, if, if you now the firm maximize, uh, we're maximizing this, maximizing return equity, uh, by adjusting the debt, the firm would set the debt so that the return, marginal return on capital is equal to RD, the average, the, 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 the marginal rate or the pay on, on debt divided by this, by this implicit tax. All right, that's simple. What happened when they changed the, what, what happened when they changed the, the, uh, the performance criterion? Well, what the key thing that changed instead of using Instead of using, think of the return on equity, the, the, um, uh, the government, uh, uh, Sussex said, look, you want, we want to use a, apply the same rate of return. Let's put five and a half percent. In that case, the, the op optimal allocation of capital is the mar margin of capital is, is five and a half percent divided by, 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 by the tax. Okay, so, um, um, so there's a profit tax of 25%. So uh, if there were no heterogeneity in this, in this rent, we can imagine that tau of y is equal to 25%. Okay, so what would this, so you can see here what this would be. If, if in the past, imagine, imagine, let's just imagine that, that these incentives really kicked in 
and, and totally dictated what managers would do. Uh, it would be then, you, then you'd see that, that firms that for some reason could borrow at a very low rate, they would in the past choose a very large cap. If they had to borrow, if the interest rate, the effective interest rate they faced was very high, um, let's not worry about yet about why the interest rate is high low, just imagine if it's, if it's high, then the capital will be low. By applying uh, the same rate of return, uh, it, you would get a much more similar uh, um, um, margin uh, of, of capital. Okay, and, and in particular, in particular, if you had, uh, if you, in the past, assuming that this firm specific wedge remains constant during the uh, before and after the reform, uh, firms that had a low interest rate in the past, they should certainly if they face a higher cost of capital, they should lower their capital. And firms that paid a high interest RD, they should increase their capital. Okay, what about, um, uh, imagine now that this, this output wedge, capital output wedge is a purely pecuniary. So since so RD is really the, 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 it's, it's the true cost of capital they face and, and uh, Tau Y is a true, is a, is a true output tax they face. In that case, um, the rate of return on equity would basically be um, um, uh, maximized if you set the margin birth of capital equal to this. Good. So if you if you see, you see these two margin products of capital, they are the same. If um, if um, if um, sorry, there's a, a little typo here, but they would be the same if if the interest rate face that the firm faces happens to be exactly 70.3 percent. Yeah. So if RD were equal to 7.3 percent, not the firm shouldn't do anything. And the return on equity will be unaffected by capital and return equity will be unaffected by the rate. However, if, if, the, if the true cost of capital was much higher, if suddenly the management behaves as if the cost of capital is 5.5%, that's going to be wasteful. That's going to lower the return on equity for the shareholders. And, and vice versa, if the true cost of capital is very low and the, and the manager suddenly starts to behave as if the cost of capital is much higher, the rate of return on capital will also fall. Therefore, uh, the rate of return on capital is going to fall if the true uh, interest rate is different from 7.3%. Okay, let's. Um, so um, imagine now that we, we measure RD as the average interest rate on interest bearing debt. Good. And let's assume that RD that captures the margin cost. Obviously, there's nothing we can do about uh, uh, if there is a term structure, blah, blah, blah. Let's just, let's just swallow that assumption for now. Let's see where it takes us. Um, okay, and then, um, the, the, then we see that, um, uh, we understand now that the EVA reform, they induce uh, uh, firms with a high cost of capital to invest less than firms with a low uh, um, uh, cost of capital um, uh, relative to what they had. And, 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 and EVA is gonna affect the allocated efficiency of capital. We'll get back to exactly how it does. Good, so the paper asks three questions. First, did the reform increase investments for state-owned firms that had high rate of return on cap relatively high rate, uh, relatively high borrowing cost in the past? The answer is yes. Second, did the reform lower the return on equity for firms where the cost of borrowing was far from 70.3%? The answer is yes. Three, did the reform affect efficiency, allocated efficiency? Unclear. I'll try to explain these results. So I like this graph. This graph is um, like an event study. So zero is the time, is the year when a particular uh, province implemented, or the Sussex in a particular uh, province, implemented um, the EVA reform. 
So, it, so what they do is to split the sample of firms into uh, two firms that have a, a high cost of debt, or that is a high RD, and firms that have a low RD. Okay, so remember, the prediction is that if you have a if it's cheap for you to borrow in the past, the reform will then increase the cost when you apply the same cost of capital forward. And if you have a high rate, a high cost of debt, now you're gonna start investing more. So on the y-axis here, it's capital expenditure. So think of this as invest, the investment. So as you can see, for them um, in the uh, leading up, lead, if we put a line here, imagine a line here in my side. Leading up to the reform, uh, the, the investments for firms with a high uh, interest rate was you know, on average falling, and it was an average increasing for those with a low uh, borrowing cost. So there was, there was you know, it is increased dispersion. Um, then when the reform, in connection with the reform, there was a substantial convergence and even stronger after two and three years. Substantial convergence in um, uh, in investment rates between those that in the past had a cheap access to cheap debt and those in the chap in the past had access to, to high debt. So you could, you could, it's, it's, it's not entirely true that, uh, that uh, uh, there is no free trend here, but it, it, you, can, you can see that it looks like there is an increased dispersion. Perhaps that is something that motivated, uh, perhaps that's something that motivated them uh, the um, provinces to implement this support. That could be, I don't think, I mean, in some sense it goes, uh, it, it would, if anything, go, um, I think, uh, against the prediction that Franco shows. I don't think it's a big problem, but the, I, it's there to some extent in a way. Uh, you can see, yeah. Okay. Uh, here, then they do this, then they run things in um, um, multivariate regressions. This, this was just a raw data. So let's focus on the first regression because this one says there's, there's no control. Here. Anyway, um, so we know from the theory, we know that somehow firms that have a high, a high interest rate, they should uh, invest little and a, a low interest rate, they should invest a lot. And that on the left-hand side here is precisely the capital expenditures uh, uh, per unit of assets. And as you can see, the interest rate enters negative, as you would expect. Now, what happens, you can also see that um, uh, it, it, uh, on average, investment was falling um, in connection with the reform, and therefore um, uh, the coefficient on cost is negative. The interesting thing is what happens when you interact the, the post army with the interest rate. That's what the paper is trying to, to, to ask. Is it the case that when you implement the form, it is the, the, the firms with a high interest rate that they increase in, in before the reform, that they increase their reform, their investments more. And the answer is yes. And, and the firm does, I think, a very convincing job at beating this uh, um, coefficient uh, uh, and showing it very robust, no matter what. Okay. Now, what about this return on equity? I think that's interesting. Um, so here they split firms in a bunch of groups. So this group four is, is a, a firms that have an average interest uh, cost of approximately 7.3%. So uh, relative to them, how does the return, how does the return on equity change before and after reform? And we 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 normalize that. The, uh, to zero for this group four. And as you can see, yeah, it looks kind of hump-shaped, but I think that's nice. It, it wouldn't have to necessarily be like that because it's not, it's not clear that we should interpret, uh, we should interpret the, uh, the, the wedge as a purely pecuniary one. It could be, you know, they got some hints from, from the government what to do. Uh, that they were, and, but anyway, it it, it works uh, as as a simple simplest version of the theory as it should. All right, um, I have not talked about risk at all. Uh, so we'll talk a bit about aggregate risk and and risk adjustment for systematic risk. But um, uh, 
the, the paper basically assumes that uh, this RD equals the expected interest rate. And if, suppose, uh, no matter what state you are, you imagine there is risk. And in all states of the world, it is um, basically the firm or the shareholders that are the ultimate, that are the, um, that are the um, uh, uh, control holders. So the, the, the shareholders, regardless of what, what, what state we're in, it's the shareholders that, that are the line. In that case, uh, I, I think it's I, I, I think it's uh, appropriate to think of um, uh, the uh, R as the expected interest rate. And, 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 but what about default risk? It, it, it's a little problematic with default risk. You could say, well, there is almost no default in the data. That turns out to be the case. So think about it. How can that possibly be? Well, it must be, it must be that Sussex sometimes bails out failing firms. Or that Sussex extends lending to firms, bail, bail out in the sense that they, some, some zombie firms are kept alive. It has to be like that. Well, if that's the case, that's a problem. Because uh, uh, it, it would be mean that the management, they wouldn't worry so much about the state of world bankers because the, the, the shareholders are not on the line then. It is Sussex then who, who is going to bail them out. So in that case, you would tend to get uh, uh, too much uh, leverage, too much risk, and overinvestment. How would the banks and Sussex uh, respond to that? Well, they would uh, constrain some firms and, and impose uh, uh, borrowing constraints on them. Um, and, and moreover, it could be if firms drop out because they go bankrupt, uh, if, uh, it would, the, the realized RD, the one we see in the, in the panel data, would then have some sort of bias. Um, uh, and, um, um, and, um, and this R, realized RD would also uh, uh, ignore bailouts and the pre potential uh, presence of born constraints. I don't think there's a perfect solution for that. The, the paper does control for leverage, which I think is, is, is useful. Uh, did the banks and the Sussex uh, change the borrowing limits after um, the, the reform? That could be. I think it would be interesting to, to look into, independently of this paper. All right, let's, talk, let's end by talking about allocating efficiency. So the paper does pursue um, uh, a shake Lenor exercise. Mm, but the, the problem is that they don't, since I don't have data on, on value added, um, they resort to following Chen and Song and just ma, ma, uh, use them uh, before tax operating profits overlying fixed assets as a measure of margin profit cap. So, what they find then is that there's just no effect on the dispersion in margin profit capital after the, the introduction of the reform. Uh, should we be surprised by that? Um, well, how can it be? It could be that the reform had, did improve allocative allocate efficiency, just that we have, uh, you know, uh, not as efficiently good measure of margin growth of capital, either because there's measurement there in the data or because we use the wrong production function or something like that. That could be. Could also be that, that um, there are, and, and I like a lot, um, the, the story that uh, uh, Zhu uh, uh, explored, namely that there, is, there could be differences across industries in the risk-adjusted cost of capital. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, there's no, um, um, you, um, so in, in, in the, what he calls good and bad dispersion, you think of that as, as efficient and inefficient. Uh, 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 removing, imposing, imposing the same cost of capital for, for firms that have different risk-adjusted cost of capital is obviously going to take you in a, in, a, in a less efficient direction. Now, there is one last possibility that I'd like to explore a bit more. It could be that there is a correlation between capital and output wedges. Something that people don't very often uh, explore, but which I think is quite interesting. So, um, the allocative efficiency tells you to, to equate the margin part of capital to the uh, All right, so 
uh, in, in the shear clever model, the distortion uh, uh, to capital is, um, is increasing in the variance of the, in the dispersion of the margin revenue product of capital, right? So let's just think about in this model, what, how does the marginal revenue product of capital change? So before the reform, uh, assuming that the managers will maximize their return on equity, so margin, margin revenue product of capital was equal to this, this um, capital wedge over the output wedge times the, the interest rate that they were facing. Right after the, after the reform, there's a there's a different formula, but but basically uh, um, the, the 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 capital wedge and the firm specific interest rate plays a much smaller role, and the five and a half percent plays a much bigger role. So imagine now that let's make it simple. Imagine that uh, imagine that this pie is uh, at twenty five percent. Uh, so the, this term drops out and that the interest rate uh, is the same for all firms. The true interest rate is the same for all firms. Imagine that the case. That would give some, I think, give the best possible shot for finding large all allocated gains of this report. So in the case of, um, in, in, in the case before the reform, if I take log, if I calculate this variance of log on, or I take log on both sides, I calculate the variance of log margin revenue for the capital, that's equal to something. Uh, uh, the variance of the capital wedge plus the variance of the output wedge uh, minus two times the covariance of this. And if I apply, um, if these wedges are close to, to zero, uh, we can write, the, approximate this as the variance of the capital wedge plus the variance of the output wedge plus two times the covariance between output and capital. All right. In the, in the, in the case of, um, of um, EVA, after EVA, uh, again, if you set pi equal 25%, you take the uh, variance of all of this and you get just the variance of the output. Okay, so which model, in which world do we get a larger variance of uh, a larger capital distortion? Well, if, um, if, if the covariance is zero, it's clear that after the reform, you should, you should get a gain, and the gain is equal to the variance of the capital. But it could be that this covariance is different from zero. So suppose, for example, if, if imagine this, Im, imagine that uh, firms that have a high RD but that high boring cost also um, have um, large output taxes. That is going to somehow worsen. That, that, that would mean that the, the output tax and the capital wedge are positively correlated. That's going to increase the, 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 the dispersion margin uh, in, 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 in margin part of capital. Uh, conversely, if it turns out that the firms that have a high cost of borrowing happens to be subsidized. Well, that's going to mitigate. Then those two distortions are going to cancel each other, so to speak. So that if, if this term was sufficiently negative, it could be that uh, you had a lower dispersion mar in, in, in margin rate of capital before than after. OK, so can we say something about that covariance? Well, the, the authors have kindly uh, 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 done uh, um, calculated some measures of, of the covariance between the output wedge and the capital wedge. So, so for example, they show that um, the correlation between, if we start from the bottom right, the correlation between the interest rate the firm pays and the effective tax rate the firm pays, that's that correlation is negative. Um, so if um, if, the, um, if the tax rate, so that means that tau, uh, tau y, that will be, tau k will be like rd, and, and effective tax rate is like tau y. So, so that's a negative number. That is something that would make, so that we make this term negative. That should actually help. What about subsidies? Well, 
turns out that subsidies are possibly correlated with the borrowing cost. Uh, 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 and, but, but subsidy is like minus tau y. That should also have, so both these two things would actually tend to make that covariance negative. And, and the, the one, the correlation with the, the subsidy is the only one that's uh, significant. And, and by the way, the way they calculated this is to take the, they take the average uh, uh, for, all, for all these variables for all years and, they, and they calculate the cross-sectional uh, correlation. Now, the political connection goes the wrong way. So imagine that having a polit political connection is associated with a negative tau i, negative output. Imagine that. Well, you see that the, the uh, RD um, um, is uh, that, that the fact that this is a negative number suggests that um, uh, this covariance is actually positive, should be positive. Um, so, uh, um, Chika, so we no, don't have much time. Could you I'm please done. wrap up? Okay, great. I am done. Okay, very well. Uh, so, uh, Chugo, would you like to have some quick? Uh, responses to Cheto's comments, especially potential problems and the last point. Maybe there's a, some, uh, uh, I can reach out to you that. I don't think the bailout, that part, uh, has a bite on our result because if it's a bailing out, then it's still counted as an interest expense. So banks are getting them. So in but some if, sense- if, if it's measured, if, if, huh? if it's, but if, if it if it shows yeah, it up mesh. as just yes. soft landing, exactly. It's that's not yeah. that if it shows up as soft landing, that's not an interest rate expense. Soft landing? If, what do you mean by if, soft? If Sussex, if, if Sussex, um, if you need a bailout, and the Sussex said, "Oh, here is some money," and you correctly, and you and your data work, you correctly measure that as an interest payment, then you're right. Then it yes. has no problem. But I, yeah, if, yeah, 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 but yes, if yes. it just means that I get some soft loans. It just increases I my debt. I see. If then there's some, some other parts, price. yeah. I, I, that I agree with, that I agree with. But the, the fact that these are uh, these are like a, you know, uh, non-performing SOEs so still keep, keep, keep surviving, which means that they are, have to keep paying these interest rates. And you're gonna well, ask who pays it, must be the SASAC. So, so then that, that's fine in the sense that the banks are, Banks are getting the uh, the pecuniary part. It's really about the pecuniary part. Of how do we measure that, right? No, it could be no? that they are just extending. I just think bail out there. Just anyway. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We can check on that. The last part that we did a little bit of the exercise a long time ago, and uh, I do think that uh, the correlation indeed gets to the right direction depend on what do we want to address. But the, the magnitude that, that, if I remember, that I can send to you the results that the magnitude of why it just doesn't help that at all. Correlation could be amplified whatever the small magnitudes, right? Because it's, it's like, it's unifree. So, 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 so that's, that's the, my, uh, just a small response to your last part. I, I will send it to you. Thanks a lot so much that I would request the, the uh, slides to you, and we will adjust our writing based on the last point. My pleasure. I forgot to say that I really enjoy reading paper. I think it's uh, very nice work. So. Thank you. And I hope okay. I got the course that I really liked it. <laughs> you know, it's you know we write papers not for like getting the. <laughs> this is really like a, the you know comments sharp comments is the most uh, welcome. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's take uh, questions first from our panelists, uh, if any. Okay, actually, I forgot to mention uh, to you, you know, uh, we have a much bigger size of audience actually on the mainland <laughs> who are watching, uh, uh, what's the name of it? Xue Shuo Ping Tai, right? Xue Shuo, Xue Yeah. And we are now uh, getting questions uh, from audiences there. And here oh. is a uh, question. It seems like the, the paper treats uh, the interest rate uh, as uh, exogenous. Um, and what if you know, uh, interest rates are endogenously determined? Um, do we still see investment increases more for firms with a high interest rate? 
So Zuko, do you have uh, anything to say on this? Uh, that's the usual, like, so, so it, you know, there's a lot of uh, things behind what's determined the interest rates. One of the thing is perhaps that, that uh, you know, I forgot to mention that if, to answer to Chato is that the, it is, it is your, the data doesn't reveal that the, whether these loans gets negotiated or not. Uh, we do know that uh, there's uh, some negotiation going on and uh, typically banks don't like those type of things. You know, think about it like uh, ailing, very bad performing firms that they can't pay. And then they start to talk to different parts and then they have dinners together, try to figure out what's going on. That kind of thing that the banks really don't want to get into. Exactly those type of issues that affect the interest rate. So if you say that interest rate is exogenous, that's clearly it's true. And what we are trying to trying to use obviously is, uh, is this policy shock. Right. If you just without using policy shock, you run these regressions. Typically, you will not get too much from from you, which you can say. And uh, what we are utilizing is this policy shock. What's more is down to this policy uh, staggered adoption, and uh, with the province times year fixed effect. So that's the part that I, I'm able to identify certain effects. Um, yeah. th still, it's there's a background identification assumptions, but the, those things are the main uh, main driver of identification, not the, the exogenous or endogenous interest rate. Yeah, so let me just uh, further cl clarify this. Actually, uh, I, I think it doesn't really matter that much uh, if you know uh, the pre-reform uh, interest rate is uh, endogenous or exogenous. What matters is, uh, is this uh, exogenous uh, policy variation that help you to, to make causal uh, inference. Uh, so uh, Bernie? Do you have uh, no, any I'm questions? Listening. I'm listening and thinking. Um, okay, then, then, then let me let me ask a Zubo question. <laughs> Although you know, I've been uh, discussing with uh, Zubo on this paper many times. You know, I I think Chetel's last point is is really interesting um, because you know if you ask me, you know, what is the uh, uh, what is the thing that I learned from the paper is first of all, you know, we see a very strong correlation between interest rate and investment. <laughs> So that that's uh, that's very true, but you know uh, we don't see any correlation between interest rate and uh, uh, MRPK. Yes. So that's also uh, uh, something uh, interesting to me. Like, oh, of course, you can argue well, there the, the, the are measurement errors and many things, but Chino's point is very interesting. You know, maybe there is a correlation, a negative correlation, between you know capital wedge and output wedge. For instance, you know. Think about before the reform, right? So those firms who are receiving, uh, uh, those firms that are that were receiving capital subsidy, somehow they are facing uh, some uh, uh, tax. So, for instance, there are some policy yeah. restrictions uh, in some industries, and um, and somehow the government, uh, I'm not so sure it's essential or local governments, uh, they, they manage to support these uh, state-owned enterprises by offering, you know, uh, capital subsidy. And in that case, uh, you won't be able to see any correlation between, uh, as exactly as Chetel pointed out, right? So in that case, I'm thinking, I'm trying to understand, you know, what would be the welfare implication if, you know, pre-reform, you see this uh, negative uh, uh, correlation between tau y and tau k. So is, is that true that you know by implementing EVA policies, you actually end up with uh, a worse worsened case because you know previously capital wedges somehow used. Of course, this is pretty crazy scenario, but in that scenario, you know capital wedge was uh, imposed to uh, reduce you know. Uh, somehow uh, uh, output wedge. Yeah. So do you have anything to say on that? This is something new to me, actually, uh, I was thinking. Two Along. points to, uh, to make is that uh, there was a one night I discussed this issue with you. <laughs> you, you probably forgot. I forgot, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> you, you forgot. And I wrote down the equation like a chateau was a write down. And then try to use the balance sheet financial statement 
to back out to this tau i, I and try to see that how much that we can get back to explain this MLPK. To, you know, we don't get the MLPK effect, right? So, so, so that part of it, as I explained it to Cheto, is that it seems the tau y that the, the part of the tau y that we can measure is so teeny, so teeny. Uh, even though it's on the right direction in terms of correlation, but the the magnitude. You mean that there is? You mean that there is very little variation in tau y? Is that what you're saying? No, there's a there's a variation, but uh, but the, the magnitude is small. Think about it. When you do the correlation, it's unit free, right? If I reduce this uh, subsidy divide by the hundred, the correlation is still the same. Right. Anyway, so so that part is. But I will send you now. Michael is on board again, so I will send you the email <laughs> telling you what I do. The second point is very important: is that I do think that you you know, I thought about it. That what if the real world is exactly somehow tau y and the tau k balanced out, then I do, I am agree with you that the, the you know, it's basically just saying that somehow the, the government is figuring out <laughs> the way to balance these two sticks and the carrots to get into the optimal again, <laughs> then, then you don't need to, 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 to do the EVA. EVA is just a, even, it's just a bad policy then, right? So, so I think this is the right the conclusion, Michael was, uh, what you know was proposing you know the intuition is basically you have two things that are somehow uh, that the government is that are giving you the credits here giving the uh, you the uh, 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 stick and you are exactly doing the what you are supposed to do even in the first best world. I I have a listener's request. Okay, I mean the last time I read the paper was uh, a few months ago, and we discussed very briefly about this. I put it this way, the, the, if we know exactly what the interest rate is, we know exactly uh, the, uh, the, the tax rate is, and we already have the 5.5, we know exactly what the results to expect. And actually your empirical results um, support the, the intuition based on all this fixed interest rate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think Gentel make, uh, make a, 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 a great contribution by pointing out that we don't, there, ex, there is fussiness in the interest rate. There is fussiness in the, um, in the, uh, in the corporate tax rate, where there's subsidy or what or whatnot. Then the question is like, I, when, when Michael asked me what, what question I have, I say, no, I'm thinking, and I cannot sort it through. I'm trying to understand your result based on the fuzziness in R and D, uh, in, in the in the in the not R and D, in the interest rate and the fuzziness in the in the in the corporate tax rate. Is there any possibility that you can give us a session in a paper on how to interpret your given result based on this you mean the welfare results, Bernie? So I would no, like to try to get a clarification. I mean, at, at the end of the day, yes, we are all thinking about the welfare effect. But how do we interpret the, the so the, the, we, I mean, the, the, without the welfare effect, just look at the, the empirical result. I, I think we know what it, what, what we, there's no doubt what they are. But how do you interpret uh, them? So, so this part of why that I, I like Chetos, <laughs> there was, one of his uh, uh, statement was that if some of the wedges are non-pecuniary, then we would not- That's exactly my point. That's exactly my point. I say like, so given that, so how do we, inter how do, is there any way for us to have clean, so, uh, have, have, uh, uh, have interpretation that we are confident of? So, okay, let me try to organize you, what you were saying. There's a two parts of a result. One, one part of a result is on identification in the sense that in this, in the, in what sense that this policy, uh, our study can establish incentive to, to the and change, change of policy. All right. Yes. So that, that itself has nothing to do with welfare. Yes, exactly. Okay. The second part is a much bigger question is on welfare. And uh, you right. know, Cheto and uh, Michael was, right. we were discussing the second, the second right. Now the first part that I thought you were saying that it seems, you know, in some sense that you were saying that it's expected. 
if if I understood your what you were saying and expected it because that we know that if everything is measured, like as measured as it's supposed to be, and according to the theory, which right, is that right, everything right. is binary, then then that's expected. Yeah. Yeah. And what I think that what Cheto was trying to say first is that first of all, a lot of the things that in uh, in, uh, in the way that the the, the, the practice is working could be non pecuniary, right? So so that in that sense, it, you know, it's it's great to, to confirming that uh, this part of the incentive, it's kind of a pecuniary incentive, really matters. It's also that a, a long time ago I presented the first time to Michael. Michael basically and by Chong Wei was there too. They were surprised by saying this actually could change the investment. You know, another alternative you could say that uh, these things just, uh, in some sense, you know, Sasak is not a, not a powerful at all, and as a result, so that all these things that, that they are doing is, you know, you could kind of like uh, just it's it's like a show. Uh, so so in that sense, that I can say that the identification side is making contribution on this uh, this this uh, establishing the link between the reform policy to the changing of investment behavior. And that is to me, it's very, very important because I see hope. From this, I see hope that you could do reform to change the SOE's behavior. Otherwise you will say everything you just done through with dinners and with, with this CCDI having coffee, that's, that's having tea or something. That's just a bad way of doing these type of things, I feel. So this is what I learned from this exercise. Yeah, the second we, the step of the welfare, agree. that's very hard. Yeah, I think we're on the same, we're on the same wavelength uh, in your last two sentences. What is hard, what, uh, what, is what we are confident of. But what, what, what I'm asking for is help in really drilling, drilling down a bit more on the hard question. What, what do we actually learn from uh, beyond this nursery for method? That's what I'm talking about, the welfare. I see. Yeah, 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 welfare. So for, for the welfare that the last time we discussed that we did some work on this industry base and now we show that the good dispersion, the, the bad dispersion that the EVA is helping to, to kill is about, uh, about a twice of the bad, bad dispersion. To me, that's basically just giving enough credit to Beijing, but in the same time, let Beijing to know that it, look, there are very, very significant part, according to my view of a risk is very important. Obviously, you know, Cheto and these, Michael might disagree, but to me that the, 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 the cost of capital difference, uh, depending on the firm's uh, ag, like the risk of characteristics is a very important part of the difference. As a result, they should take those things into account. All right. That so, part is about a half of the of the discussion. I agree with that. That's a very nice point. Yeah. All right. So we have a very productive and stimulating uh, webinar. We have to end here. Uh, uh, Bernie, uh, do you have anything to say? Uh, I, I, will, I want to thank the uh, for the authors and Gentile is really a very stimulating thing, and we. A uh, good seminar is one that we learned a lot, and afterwards we have a lot more questions. So thank you very much, and I want to thank the audience. Um, I want to point out that uh, we are going to to take a break um, in in uh, in April and May because the third week of April the team will be very busily preparing for the main conference, and we are going to host our main conference in May from the turn. Uh, from the uh, from the uh, uh, from the twenty uh, from the twenty uh, third to twenty six, and then AMPF on the twenty uh, on the twenty seven with a joint dinner on the twenty six, and we are doing face to face as well as uh, allowing some hybrid uh, online. Uh, I really look forward to seeing everyone. Um, then um, uh, on June sixteenth. Uh, we will have um, the rising of payment firms by Professor Tobias Berg from the Frankfurt School. So I look forward to seeing you face to face in Singapore, as well as uh, seeing some of you uh, online on June 16th. Thank you very much. And thank you, Michael, for sharing. Thanks, Chato. Thank you.